Hello once again, and welcome to Life's a Breach. Um, today we've got an interesting one. Uh, it's a topic near and dear to my heart, and probably to a lot of yours, whether you're coming at this from uh, the security team angle or from uh, the builder or developer or engineer angle. Um, we all know that really, uh, you know, there's the standardized trope in uh, in our organizations, which is very much true in that it's security versus everybody else. Now, there's a ton of history behind this. Trust me, I've lived it. There is reasons for all of it, um, but it really is a challenge. And it's a challenge that thankfully, it seems like we're starting to actually move past you know, ish. Um, we're finally recognizing that there are shared goals uh, between these teams. We're all working on the same things. Um, and today we're going to take a deeper dive into this issue. And joining me is Ali Diamond. She's a developer advocate here at Lacework um, and has a lot of experience educating developers, engineers, and working with the community in general. Ali, welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm super excited to be here. You can find me on Twitter if you're curious at Adding with Ali. Um, and I also live stream on my own Twitch channel under the name Adding with Ali. So if you want to come learn about cool security things, I'm always learning security there. So. Yeah, and I highly recommend you check out our live streams. They're a ton of fun, um, really educational as well, which is a really hard needle to thread, but Ali does it really, really well, um, hitting that tone perfectly. And you know, what better way to learn than learning in a fun environment? Um, so Ali, thanks for coming on. Um, this is the first time we've been able to have a chat like this on a live stream, and I'm really excited for it. I think it's gonna be a ton of fun. Uh, for everybody in the audience, as a reminder, we are obviously live. Um, thankfully, no glitch like last time, uh, where I forgot to unmute my audio. So, you know, human glitch, always always standard with me, um, but we are live. So that means we're taking your comments and we will take your questions. So please feel free to drop those in LinkedIn um, and we will bubble them up and add to the conversation. This show only gets better the more participation we have. Uh, so don't be shy. Uh, if you want to uh, jump into the conversation, please feel free to. But we're going to start with uh, sort of a level setting question. And this is something that I've asked a ton of uh, different technologists. And I'm curious to see your answer to this one, Allie. Um, how much security education did you get? when you were first starting getting into development and into coding and into technology in general? Yeah, um, so formal or informal is the better question, but I'll talk about formal. So technically, um, so for context, I went to college for computer science. I also have a master's degree, uh, but in my college education, which um, I had one security class, which I chose to take. It wasn't necessary, it wasn't mandatory, but it was a class that I was super excited to take. So I took a security class, but beyond that, there really wasn't any security education. Um, outside of formal education, I have been self-taught. I've taken um, a few week long course with some CTF people, um, as well as have just been keeping my ear to the ground about security. And so that's sort of how I've been learning. Yeah, well, I mean, based on, on your Twitch streams and based on your on your output, you're a very self-driven learner, right? So that's to be expected. But what really kind of stands out for me there is that across uh, both an undergraduate and a master's, so six years ballpark-ish uh, of five, right on. Well, of course, you're an overachiever. So there you go. In five years, you had one course that was focused on cybersecurity, and that was an elective. Uh, now, the good news is you had a course, uh, because that's that's sort of where we're at. If you look at programs around the world, is that it's sort of available as an elective now, whereas even 10 years ago, it wasn't. Um, it just wasn't mentioned. But one uh, course out of five years, obviously not enough to cover um, anything beyond the basics. And I don't know about you. I mean, it's obviously been way, way longer since I was in school, but I don't remember much about any individual course. So it's, you know, did you feel coming out of school, you know, if you can rewind a couple of years, did you feel prepared from a security perspective at all? No, absolutely not. Honestly, um, it was a lot of theory and a lot of like, so the way that the course was run, and if you want to look up this course, actually, you can find a lot of the materials online. It's MIT 6858. Um, so if you just look up MIT 6858, you'll find it. Um, but it was a lot of reading older um, papers and then sort of doing hands-on labs 
that were using these exploits, but they weren't modern exploits. They weren't teaching you modern security principles, but it was like almost security theory in a way. Um, I will say that I think that my course was also a very different and very weird because I had Robert Morris of the Morris Worm teaching me that year. And I was like, whoa, like, who is this dude? Because I remember I, I, um, and for that course, I was really excited for the course and I started studying for the course before the course even started because I heard that it's one of the hardest classes that you could take at MIT. Um, and so I started reading all the books beforehand and reading the papers. I remember reading the first paper and then them being like, this is the person that's teaching. And I was like, you were in the paper that was assigned to us. And I went up to him and was like, whoa, like you're the person that's in this paper. And he was like, yeah, I was really dumb back there. And then I swear to God, he hated me for the rest of the the rest of the time he was just like why'd you talk to me about this i was like well it was in your curriculum mm -hmm. but Fair. um it was a lot of like again the morris worm is from the 80s it's things that were older and there are extensive studies written about it so mm -hmm. i wouldn't say it's like things that are modern now like focusing on cloud security it was a lot of yeah. more almost application security in a way and not necessarily what we do here at lacework which is cloud security yeah, and that's fair. And as a lot of people, especially in a CS program, their first introduction is around sort of traditional AppSec. Um, and, you know, with that academic lens, and A, I love how you tackled the course. And I mean, that's demonstrated that sort of keen attitude and that driven, uh, you know, momentum for yourself, I think, we need as technologists, we need that that uh, that ability because we need to constantly be learning, especially in cloud, especially in security, especially in cloud security, because stuff changes nonstop, right? Like we see yeah. new new things going all the time. And yeah, I, you know, I, I would have been geeking out as well uh, if, it were, if Morris was there. Um, but, you know, your experience, though a little above sort of the typical one, is I think an accurate reflection is that uh, security education in the formal uh, education structures we have is a very, very tiny fraction of what's available. So let's flip this a little bit. And based on you know what you've been doing for the last few years, which is being super active in our community and helping raise everybody else's knowledge up, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is for uh, engineers or developers who are starting their security journey? Yeah, I think, well, starting the security journey or starting their developer journey and keeping security in mind, because I want to clarify that because there's two yeah, different things. That's a good, that's a good pushback. I like that. So let's, let's tackle it. I think everybody's sort of familiar with the security journey generically. So let's dive into that. If you're a developer and you're going, okay, I need to, I know security is important, but I got one course, maybe if I was lucky out of my entire education, how do I keep that in mind as I'm going forward to, to do all the other stuff that I really know well because I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Um, one, and so the biggest challenge here I think is, um, first of all, getting people to think at that point, I feel like is such a big challenge <laughs> because like, um, and I'll probably say this a lot, but you know, engineers have so much work on their plates and are in such high demand and they're being pulled from so many different corners that to think in a security minded way when approaching problems, when they're under super high deadlines, that adds an extra layer of work that they don't necessarily want to tackle at the time because they just need to get their work done in order to get to the next thing because there's just so much on their plates, as I said. Um, and so first, the biggest struggle is getting them to think about that. And I think that's what I'm personally really excited about is trying to figure out a way to make security education really ingrained in teaching um, young engineers from day one how to think with a security-minded approach um, for all their problems. So it's not an extra layer of effort they have to put on is just naturally ingrained. And I, I think that that's, um, that's something I personally am really passionate about just because I personally, as a young engineer was like, oh my God, what if I do this wrong and someone can break in and oh my God, uh, I don't know if everyone has that anxiety that I have, but personally to me. So that's what got me really excited about security. Um, but when it comes to just starting the education and like knowing where to go first, I think, first of all, if your company has a security person, go talk to them. Please just go talk to them. <laughs> like they have so much work on their plate, but if you're just like, Hey, I am an engineer. And like, I just want to learn 
about what our security best practices are. Because again, for every company, every company has a different risk level. Every company has a different amount of security they're willing to uh, enforce, not security they're willing to enforce, but basically a different amount of risk they're willing to take on um, and different ways that they approach all their problems. You should go to the company that you're at now and just be like, hey, like I'm really interested in learning about what our biggest security issue is, especially when it comes to our engineers, like, what can I do to learn? And they'll probably have a hundred things to teach you. But I mean, beyond that, I think that the second thing as an engineer, um, when you're getting started in your, in your security journey is just, um, it's okay. I, I, I constantly quote this number. So it is an estimated that like 80% of security issues are human caused. So you don't need to be sitting there doing like doing, Um, static analysis on your code and learning how to do static analysis. And for those who are listening, static analysis is basically programmatically figuring out where there are issues in your code um, Mm -hmm. through analysis of what's actually written and and basically like using variable, I'm going to do say this wrong, but basically like flipping through all the different types of variables to figure out where bugs can be thrown. That's like a really TLDR version of a static analysis is such a huge field, but instead it's figuring out what are the security practices that you as an engineer can put into your day-to-day life um, that aren't necessarily even code-based. Yeah, fair. That's a lot, um, but. <laughs> it's a lot and that's good. Uh, and so one of the things that you uh, said there that jumped out at me was that as an engineer, you've got a ton of work on your plate and security, the way you phrased it was that security wasn't part of that work. And I think that's sort of the, the, the nugget that we see from coming from the security side is that it's considered like, oh no, that's security work not yeah. it's engineering work right and that's something that i know i always uh fight against and try to educate people on is that security is one of many concerns just like performance and operational overhead and the cost when we're in the cloud and stuff like that but it's not this other thing that other people need to be aware of like yes there will be security experts who are much deeper than me as a coder however like i need to know that you know i shouldn't be opening up things and leaving you know session tokens everywhere and like you know uh it, it used to be, I'll show my age. Thankfully, I cut out almost the gray and white, but, you know, creating buffer overruns in my code and, you know, um, all these sort of standard mistakes that lead to security issues. Because at the end of the day, a security issue is just a mistake somewhere in the code or the system that somebody with malicious intent is going to take uh, yeah. advantage of, right? Um, so let me dive into a bit of a bit of a different angle because I love how, how you structured that and had that, you know, like go talk to the security people. Like imagine that, two different teams talking to each other, like, mind blowing if it actually happens, right? Um, On that cultural side, when you're in your, you know, uh, educating people and and pushing for these efforts, um, do you see friction between the security team and and the teams who are building stuff? I mean, on the education side, I feel like security teams are just excited to have more representation in the developer world. Um, But I think that a lot of the friction I, I personally, from my observation, come the friction comes from security teams being like, hey, there's this thing. And then engineers like, we'll handle it later. And then security team gets woken up at 2 a.m. being like, oh, that thing that I told you to fix is now an issue? <laughs> You're stupid. Not saying that, but like, you know, yeah. it's just like these things that the security teams are calling out and they're not getting the respect and they're so understaffed. Please hire another security person like i promise you it'll make their lives better maybe (laughs) not have two people rotating every other day staying up 24 hours straight because your company has security issues every day um maybe hire a more robust team so that they can get a full night's sleep um (laughs) but um yeah it's when engineers are trying to get their things done they're not respecting their security team and i will say this oh my god we're at, we work at Lacework and I'll say this, like when you're building new things and you just like put Lacework in there, we're automatically taking away a level of work that has to be done by your security teams, reducing that friction because we can automatically catch, here at Lacework, we can automatically catch when you spin up new cloud services, the issues yep. that would be security concerns from the security team. And if the security team has the right of learning um, set up, you can automatically know which ones they're going to want you to fix, reducing that friction between teams. So yeah. 
just yeah. throwing that out there. Please work. Back there. So, so it's funny because I, I, you know, I mean, I've been back in the private sector uh, on the vendor side for the last 11 years or so. And before that, I was in, uh, active in security frontline for 20. And the security side of it, like I totally get like, hey, you know, talk to us more that you know but the alternative is security needs to be out more explaining because one of the one thing you mentioned that really popped to mind was that i find it's very difficult for security teams and i've written about this a bunch in on the lace work blog and a bunch of other places it's very difficult for security teams to properly frame their issue in the larger business context so if i'm a developer and if you and i are working on something and we've got a backlog a mile long um, you know, how do we prioritize when security knocks on the door and says like, hey, this is super important. Well, yeah, it may be super important to security, but we also have a feature that if we don't ship it today, we lose a million in revenue. And yeah. so to figure out that balance is hard, but I think you already hit it on the head, which is talk to each other. Like actually have a conversation about like, I as security, I'm concerned about this. You as developers are concerned about that. And, and that goes, uh, you know, a long way. And just as a, as a side note, just as a reminder, um, we are live. So if you have questions, drop them in the comments. Um, I dropped a link to uh, one of the latest posts from the Lacework Labs team. And it's not that we're trying to pump up the company here, um, but Ali had mentioned static analysis. And actually the labs team did an in-depth dive uh, into how they were using static analysis to look at the spring shell uh, vulnerability last week um, in Java. And so that link is in the comments. You guys can go check out that blog post. It is very technically focused, um, but it's fascinating because it shows the advantage of how to use that tool. Um, and that's actually one thing that I wanted to ask you about, Ali, is that we have a bunch of tools in security, like static analysis, um, like uh, configuration, um, like posture management and stuff that will help developers. But I, I know from my experience, I rarely see that information actually getting to the developers to help them make uh, any of those decisions. And so, um, Understanding that this all needs to start with conversations, but is there anything um, that you would suggest as far as developers to start, like how they would get exposure to some security topics if they're just starting that, like, hey, I know security is important and I want to dive in? Yeah, um, getting exposure. I So, okay, on my personal blog, I wrote all about this, blog.ally.dev, but Twitter is, if you're a developer and you're not on Twitter, you're missing out. I'm sorry. I'll just say it. You need to get on Twitter as a developer. Um, whether that's like, even if it's not for like fun as a professional on Twitter, um, hearing about what's happening in your communities, what's happening, updates uh, that are coming around, just like learning new facts and tips about your favorite languages and, and, and libraries, but also the security community is so active. And even that um, that blog post that you just linked um, with the spring, I'm going to spring for, I just shell. like spring for shell. Yeah. That yeah. started off as a tweet. Yes. That was a tweet. Someone tweeted about that. You're finding out now more about what's happening in the security community on Twitter than anywhere else. Um, and so it's if you just want to know about what's happening in the security space or just getting security tips, get on Twitter. Um, it's not something that you need to be on all the time, but it's just like a small thing that can help you stay more active in that space. Yeah, fair. Um, and on Twitter, uh, InfoSec, Cybersecurity, and DFIR are good hashtags to follow. Um, so DFIR is Digital Forensics and Incident Response. Um, and so a lot of us in the community use that when you know what hits the fan um, and we start talking about those kind of issues that normally falls under those kind of hashtags. Because I agree, as much as Twitter has, let's say, its challenges um, so socially and a bunch of other things, there is a ton of great uh, technical information on there. Um, and yeah, it was nuts in that the uh, early days of, the, of that vulnerability, which ended up being two vulnerabilities, the discussion on Twitter, when you filtered out some of the noise, because there's always noise in social media, um, there was great technical information and there was a lot of good, uh, you know, people in the community cutting through the FUD going like, no, here's a reputable research team who's breaking down the issues. Go look at it, go check it out. Um, and, and you can learn that way for sure. Um, so on that note, uh, you know, especially uh, having, you know, you're, you're, in it well into your security journey. Um, there is a ton of ridiculous specialties and acronyms and it can be really, hard for somebody who's approaching security and going like, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, Ali's got me ramped up. I want to go talk. I want to learn about security. You start to Google it and you just go like, 
oh, oh, this is not like, this is not easy to approach because yeah. there is just a massive amount of stuff. So is there an area that you would, beyond just, you know, surfing Twitter, finding out some stuff, is there a, a, an approach or a place that you would suggest that people start coming from that developer, uh, that developer avenue? Yeah. Um, so I personally, when I started my security journey, I went on Try Hack Me um, and just picking like one of their introductory courses and walking through it, I think will just give you at least a little bit more breadth of security terms and knowledge that um, you could do at your own pace. And I'm don't quote me on this, but I think there are some free versions. I, I think, think so. you can do it for yeah, free. Yeah. Um, I personally pay for it because I use it as a tool for education on my Twitch stream. Um, but at the same time, like I use Try Hack Me, just um, they'll teach you a lot of different terms. My notebook is over there where I have like written out all these terms. I am not a term person. I can describe things, but I'll always forget the word. So at least something like that, like I'll understand. And it's very interactive. So you go on, they'll give you like um, a, a computer, like a, a excuse me, a, a VM that you can work yeah. on and try these things out and learn at the same time. So you kind of have the opportunity to do hands-on education for yourself instead of just reading blog posts, because I'm definitely someone who learns by doing, and I personally found that very exciting. And I think it's a couple of times you've mentioned the, the hands-on experience. And I think that's critical for everybody is even like, I'm, I'm a reader. I love to read. I'll read nonstop, whether it's security stuff or not, but it really sinks into a whole nother level when I then go apply it. Right. Yeah. And go like, oh, okay, cool. Now I'm going to try that and poke around and, and and play with it. You know, it's the same with anytime a new cloud service comes out. You can read the the introduction, you can look at the APIs and stuff, but you don't really know it until you played around with it. You made some calls to the APIs and then you know got some hands-on experience. So um, that's awesome advice. Very, very cool. Um, we've got a question from the audience from Sierra here. And uh, they are asking, uh, what are some high-level challenges uh, you see um, when it comes to development teams having to work with security teams and, and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like I touched on this before. It's the fact that security developers have a lot on their plates. They're getting pushed to do all these things and security teams are considered the slowing down factor. But now I will say again, with tools like Laser, we can make it faster for you to get your products out there. Oh my God, um, <laughs> shilling, always be shilling. Um, <laughs> but um, like, yeah, it's just because, well, one, first of all, security teams are overworked and there's not enough of them. And there is a huge gap in the security um, hiring market right now where everyone wants to hire extremely skilled security engineers, but no one wants to bring on the new, the new faces of the security team. So teams are remaining small because they don't have the bandwidth to onboard new security people. Uh, so first of all, people just at the time of day. And I know I'm saying go talk to your security people, but at the same time, they're busy too. So advocate like, hey, maybe like we should get more security people in, in our company. I think that's first and foremost, such a big thing. Um, but also uh, high level challenges. I'm just rereading this question here because I want to make mm -hmm. sure I touch it. Um, yeah, so security teams not having enough time because one, they're really sleepy. Let your security team sleep. And two, um, developers having pressure to move fast. So it's just yeah. a combination of things. It, it's sure. everyone's doing their own things and they, they're they directly conflicting. Security teams are like, hey, do fast, but slow down. Uh, developers like, hey, do fast, go faster. Yes, and there is always that pressure, right? And so to put a number to something you mentioned a couple of times, which is, you know, we can't get enough security people. There's been negative unemployment in cybersecurity for the last 11 years. Um, I think we're like 6% below, uh, like 6% negative unemployment, which is great as a practitioner, right? You've always got opportunities. Um, but the average, this was a couple of years ago, I talked to some analyst friends and based on their surveys, the average uh, number of security people in a company, so for larger enterprises, it's like for full time is it like 500 for one person 500 750. engineers 750 overall employees for one full-time security person which means one person is responsible for the tooling and work output for 750 people which i don't know about you but i can barely keep track of what i do I'm not going to keep track of 749 other people. Like it just, it's too much. It's overwhelming. Now, that being said, that's the reality. You can't change that. You know, it's great to say, hey, go, go hire some more people. But if they're not out there, it's really difficult. And so what I would add to Ali's answer um, is that 
it really is about communication. And I think it's about focusing on that shared goal. And you need to, while you're still trying to move fast as a developer, is you need to understand that if you take a deep breath and talk to security and say, wait a minute, I wanna make sure that I'm gonna make a better decision now so that I don't have to do a bunch more work later. And so the, the very simplistic answer I always use um, from the development perspective is this, is if you said, I wanna make sure that like all my uh, communications traffic is encrypted. If you design that from day one, normally that's just a parameter and a function, right? You just go like, yeah, encrypt it, great, done. And you're problem solved, right? Like from day one, it's there. If you wanted to go back and do that, it's gonna take a week of work, which is not a lot, but it's a week of work that's not outputting anything that's visible to the customer. It's something smart, but like an instantaneous change versus like a week and burning half a sprint. Like that's not a, a good trade-off, right? You want to be able to do that um, early on and have that, you know, what you would term their security thinking, right? That security mindset. Um, and so it's it's a challenge and, and it all stems from communication. In the before times, my number one recommendation was always go buy somebody a coffee. Whether you're on the security team and want to talk to the engineers or the engineers want to talk to the security people, we're all very tired and we need coffee. And it's a great Great way of opening the door and be like, hey, Ali, can I talk to you for a few minutes? I will buy coffee. And, you know, five bucks, great investment to start building that bridge um, to have that conversation. And so um, Sierra has a great follow-up here that I will I will pose to you, Ali, which is, uh, do security uh, and development engineers, do they like to collaborate in person with each other or do they use tools to communi uh, communicate issues? And so by in-person, she refines that as like in a war room daily or something like that. What's your experience? What does that communication look like? You know what? I can't speak to this, actually. I don't okay. have experience with this. I can't say specifically. I've only seen from the security aspect after like spending time with security professionals and then from the developer aspect after spending time with developers, but never haven't spent too much time in the interbetween. Hence why I say more communication so I can see that communication more. Yeah, fair. And so in my experience, and you know, I've sadly been doing this a very long time, um, too long when I reflect back, but in a good way, I think maybe. Um, the uh, the challenge, I think, what Ali hit on earlier was the the amount of work that both teams are normally faced with makes that sort of daily uh, collaboration difficult. Um, now, in the matter of like an incident response, when you know what's hit the fan and we need to fix something, or there's an active attack or something like that, yeah, a war room makes sense. You get everybody in the same page, and now that's a Slack channel most of the time of going like, okay, everything about that incident's here. But I think um, having that daily requirement is a challenge. It's really starts with an informal level of communication. And so I find it's easier in a remote world because I can just ping somebody super quick and they can get back to me when they need to. Um, right. And in the, in the physical world, if you're working in a physical location, then it's that coffee aspect um, to keep that informal going, because it's really more of a mindset to start with, I think, if that's fair, rather than specific actions. Like, I don't need you to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I need you to start thinking about these things so that when you're deciding, do I pick service A or service B, that you pick the one that has a better match with our risk appetite. Right. And that's not I mean, you can call in for help for that specific decision. But I think it's really that uh, overall sort of mentality, uh, which builds up over time. Um, so let me circle back here. And I mean, we're coming up close to, to, to wrapping this up, but there is a couple more things I want to pose uh, to you, Ali, because I think this has been fantastic and you get a ton of great information, a ton of great experience. Um, so I will. I will take the hit on behalf of the security community here. I think I'm a good proxy, is that we rightfully so in the security community have a, a, a reputation for everything that we do is really slow and cumbersome. Um, you know, we, we're the house of no. Uh, and yet you've said multiple times that the engineering, the development side is like, go, 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 right? Like go fast and then go even faster. Um, and so what have you seen be successful or what's your recommendation based on your learnings and what you've seen and what you've helped teach people um, to make sure that if you're adopting a security focus as a developer, that you don't fall into that like slow as molasses, turtle speed security mode um, and keep things going fast. Okay. I was literally about to make this comment like in between this. I'm really glad you said this because I think this is perfect. If you are thinking about like doing something do the work for the security team already. And I think a really great example of this is utilizing a new tool, for example. Um, if there's a new tool that you want to use, um, probably don't just go rogue and like put, put your whole team on it. 
Um, instead, have an open communication with your security team. Be like, hey, here's the tool that we want to use. Here's the, the link to their security review because some companies are like, here's, here's, yeah. I think a really great, and this is like such, this isn't like necessarily coding related, but like Notion. I really, at a company, I really wanted to use Notion. And so what I did was I found, I literally, I wasn't a developer. I was doing developer advocacy. I found Notion's um, like security write-up page about mm -hmm. like why you should trust them and like what a breakdown is. And I just like was like, hey, IT, I want to use Notion. Here's their security breakdown. Like here's where you can learn more. What do you think? Um, and I still got to know. <laughs> but um, like it's still like I like they got a no back to me fast because so they didn't have to do that work. So yeah. like when you're making like when you're going through and making these decisions as a developer, like make sure you're thinking completely through things, just like how you're trying to catch edge cases. Like what are those edge cases that edge cases that your security team will probably have to think about? And I mean, in your code, necessary not necessarily you're gonna have to think about that all the time because those are edge cases in your code. But as someone who's spinning up diff or utilizing different um Libraries in your code, for example, supply chain attacks are a big thing that are happening right now. Like, mm -hmm. how can you securely trust an open source library that you're putting in? And how can you make it easier for your security team to trust that open source library? Yeah. And I think that's really good general advice. Um, the last example is a giant avenue of a whole other live stream we're going to have to do together to have that conversation on dependencies and supply chain security. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I would add to that is if you're introducing a new tool, what really will help besides just the, the security page is tell me what kind of data you want to put into it. So yeah. if you're saying, oh, hey, yeah. I want to use, so Notion, right, is like a uh, or team organization, like database uh, notes, combination, it's kind of everything. Um, but if you're using that and you're saying like, hey, we want to coordinate this one specific external event versus we want to do all of our sprint planning on it, those are two very different data sets, right? And the security team may be like, oh yeah, that stuff's going to be public. If it leaks out a little earlier, that's fine. Versus sprint planning is all your, oh, we're doing all our design work in there. That's a protected IP. That's something different. Um, so I think that's a great tip as far as, you know, try to hedge the little bit of bets, because I think that's the same way we want within development teams is if I was proposing to you that, hey, we're going to use this new library because it's going to make our life easier. That pitch should include the reasoning and the 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 like. Hey, this is a well supported library. Here's what the advantages are. Like, think you know, use the the sort of the complete picture um, was the way you, you phrase it a little bit differently. But that's what you're getting at as far as that like present it as a whole thing, not just the oh by the way, five months ago we moved absolutely all of our core IP to this new platform nobody's ever heard of. Not a great way to open a conversation. Um, this is this has been fantastic, Ali. I really appreciated the time. I really appreciate the conversation. Um, thank you to everybody listening. We've gotten some great co uh, comments and questions. Keep them coming. But we always try to end Life's a Breach with something that's a little more concrete for the audience, um, even though we've done a ton of great throughout this conversation, which is excellent. Um, but what are... So you mentioned one resource already, and it's already flown my old adult mind. So we may want to recap that one. But can you give a couple of resources that where you think um, they would get starting points for people uh, to go learn, whether it's hands on or just even reading? Yeah. Um, so the first resource and the resource that I mainly rely on is Try Hack Me. Um, and then also, uh, I'm trying to think of like other resources. Um, there's a lot of people who write their own blogs. Oh, my God. Crap's on security. Duh. Go read him. Uh, go read that blog. Amazing. Um, and then I'm going to just quickly look this up because I recently had the opportunity uh, to talk with them oh, and nice. they have, oh no, I just blanked out on their name. They have a blog. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm blanking out it, on this. You can add it. Um, you can add it back in the comments on the post. I'll add it afterward. in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah all good. Um, and yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Brian Krebs uh, is a, a independent journalist who does a ton of great deep dives. He's got a couple of really good books out as well um, on uh, what's going on. He's been at it forever. Um, and so uh, for the lapsus uh, gang breaches um, a couple um, about a month ago now, um, he had a really good breakdown on uh, some insider info on like the forums and uh, the activity within this uh, cybercrime collective. Um, so some really interesting insights. Okay, I got the name. It's Alpha alphacybersecurity.tech. Perfect. Okay. So and this is a, a blog resource? by my friend. He like literally the first blog post is SIM swapping attacks, how it works and how to protect yourself. Like that's a huge thing that you can learn so much from. And they write like super informative blog posts. So I just wanted to throw Perfect. his blog out there. 
That's awesome. That's exactly what we're looking for because that's a concrete takeaway. Some of you will read a couple of those posts today and have learned a ton from you during this conversation and a ton from your friend from their blog and then uh, Krebs and a bunch of others as well. Um, with that, uh, we are going to wrap up this conversation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ali. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your experience and knowledge. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Um, but yeah, if you are a viewer and you want to come see more of my beautiful face, um, you can follow me on Twitch and on Twitter on everything, including Minecraft at ending with Allie. I'm, we love a consistent, uh, consistent branding, you know? Yeah. Um, so follow me there. Perfect. Thank you. And yeah, I strongly recommend following Ali on our platforms. Absolutely tune into her Twitch streams. They're tons of fun and very, very educational, which as I said, hard needle to thread, but she does it very, very well. Um, remember, we stream Life's a Breach um, regularly here on LinkedIn. So make sure that you're following the Lacework LinkedIn page. Um, you're already on that page, so easy enough to do. Um, we uh, and That'll give you a notification every time that we go live. And obviously, we will uh, give you a heads up before we do that a couple of days so that you can uh, plan in your schedule, uh, which is always good. Please keep those questions coming uh, in the comments. We do monitor uh, these posts all the time. So if you have any questions on what Ali and I talked about today um, or suggestions about what we should be uh, streaming in the future um, and uh, other topics that you'd like to see, let us know. This only gets better the more uh, we get participation. With that, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you in the next one.